Um, I also just want to say from the outset that what I say is my own experience and my opinion, and that if you'd like to uh, find SLAA's um, opinion on all of these issues, you're welcome to have a look at the variety of literature that is available. Um, so a bit of background about myself. I am in Cape Town, South Africa, and I came into this fellowship just under two years ago. I mean, I'd had brushes with SLAA a couple of times, uh, but I think two years ago, I finally became ready to surrender to my disease. Um, I, yeah, my, my history is pretty much like everybody else's, um, but I'll go into a bit of detail about, you know, my own experience um, in my addiction. So I was born into a, quite a dysfunctional family. Um, my father was an addict. Um, he was addicted to drugs and he, you know, he was the type of drug addict that would, you know, sell our clothes and he was very violent and very, very abusive. Um, and my mother was very codependent with my father and enabled him, you know, she kind of just let him get away with whatever he got away with. And of course that was very traumatic for me as a child. Um, very early on, um, from a very early age, I, I started to get involved in my head quite a lot, you know, with fantasy, um, watching Disney movies and thinking that somebody was going to, you know, come in on a shining white horse and rescue me. And I would disappear into these fantasies for hours on end. And, um, you know, my relationship with, with sex particularly started quite young. Um, I would have encounters with boys in school, um, you know, this started at around seven years old. Um, and I always had a very compulsive relationship with men and boys and sex. It was always something that I knew made me feel good. And I always gravitated strongly towards the things that made me feel good, things that I could use to escape um, my reality, which was very painful to exist in. Um, and I, I mean, even at a young age, I knew that there was something quite different about me. And there was, diff there was something different in the way that I reacted to things that made me feel good, particularly around sex and love. Um, so my sexual education and my experiences around sex and, and love started quite early. Um, I grew up and um, I, I, I'm a co-addict, so I also have um, issues with drug addiction and an eating disorder. So my first admission to kind of a psychiatric hospital was for an eating disorder when I was 15. Um, you know, that was also as a response to me trying to control um, the out, my outside situation from the inside. Um, and, but for me, my real kind of the, the unmanageability in my sex and love addiction started in my early 20s. Um, I, I started to become more explorative, I suppose, sexually. I mean, as a young, as, as a teenager and as a, as a, a child, I'd explored quite a lot, but now I had the freedom to be able to, I put freedom in inverted commas here, freedom to do whatever I wanted to do. And I got into my first serious relationship with a man when I was 19. Um, he was about 37 and we met on social media and I was very lonely. I just moved to Cape Town and, you know, I, I wanted to be with somebody. And I was, a teetotaler at this time, you know, I didn't really use drugs. I was vegan, you know, very into yoga and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but once that relationship ended, I started to compulsively date and I got into a relationship with somebody else a couple of days after my breakup with this guy. Um, and that relationship was, I was extremely toxic in that relationship. I was extremely controlling, extremely, extremely, extremely manipulative, power hungry, um, you know, just trying to get whatever I could out of this person and abuse him to make me feel better. I also compulsively cheated um, on this guy. I was about 20 and he was 19 and I compulsively cheated on him. And our breakup was extremely damaging and, and really painful for, for both of us. But of course, me being somebody who, you know, needs to protect my interests and my well-being, I hopped into a relationship two weeks later. Um, this time around, I was 21 and I thought that I'd found the love of my life. You know, I was really in love with this guy. But for me, love manifested in 
disappearing into another person. It got to a point where I wasn't even willing to let this guy take his shoes off. You know, I had to get down on my knees and take off his shoes. Um, I did everything for him. And because of my codependence and my desperate need for validation, he started to pull away from me. And um, when we broke up, I tried to commit suicide. And I ended up in hospital. After that, I sort of got into the realm of um, anonymous sex, you know, using um, hookup apps and that kind of thing to meet guys. And that escalated exponentially once I found my drug of choice, when I started using drugs every day. Um, very quickly, my sex addiction um, spiraled and I was in and out of treatment centers, rehab centers. Um, and I was sometimes sleeping with five, 10 guys a day. Um, and, you know, I ended up losing my job and I decided to get involved in sex work. Um, so I became a full-time sex worker and got into the industry. Um, but for me, you know, while I thought that, you know, the basic text talks about living this life, you know, free of morals, free love, anything goes, who cares kind of uh, vibe. For me, there was this pervasive aching loneliness that came with all of that. I just felt absolutely empty and at, and at odds with everyone and everything around me. You know, I really believe that, you know, I was living a life free of morals. You know, I transcended all of these kinds of ridiculous denials that I'd built around my addiction. But at the end of the day, I was socially unacceptable, you know, and I was hurting myself and everybody around me. So in 2019, after, you know, serious consequences of my acting out, my using, you know, I decided to go into treatment again for the 19th time um, at 25, 26, on my 26th birthday, actually. And um, it was the best decision I ever made, really. You know, I think I was at a point for the first time where I was really ready to change. I knew that the life that I'd been living hadn't been working for me. You know, I dedicated everything that I had to being a sex and love addict and an addict, and it had paid no dividends. <laughs> I was left bankrupt spiritually, morally, psychologically, you know, in every conceivable way I was bankrupt. So I decided to work a program and to really get involved and to, and to jump into this thing head first. And I found myself a sponsor and I very quickly got involved with service and I picked up, I worked the 30 day, the, the, the how program, the how concept, um, that's what's worked for me. There are, the, there are other step methods available, but this is the one that I did. Um, and honestly, when I came into this program, I looked at my bottom line behaviors, which my sponsor had set out for me. And I honestly thought that there was no way in hell that I could survive without sex or attention or men or relationships or dating apps. You know, I'd sacrificed my life to all of these things, but I did it. You know, the willingness overtook me and, and I prayed for that willingness and my higher power gave me the strength to do what I needed to do. And very quickly, I started to see enormous change in my life. Um, and a couple of, you know, about a year and a bit into my program, um, I'd taken on sponsees. I, you know, I'd really grown a lot as a person. I'd gotten a message on Instagram from somebody that I'd previously had had sex with, you know, we'd been, we'd kept in touch while I was in recovery. And he said to me, oh, uh, do you want to go out for coffee? And in my head, I knew that that coffee wasn't necessarily something platonic, like it could potentially be a date. And I think I was about one and a half years off my bottom lines when, when that encounter happened. And instead of me feeling anxious, overwhelmed, fearful, jumping into the future, you know, worrying about a whole myriad of different things, there was a serenity that came over me and a calm that came over me. And I thought to myself, you know, I would be comfortable going out on a date. You know, I would be comfortable going out on a date with this person. I feel ready. And in that moment, I knew that I had moved through withdrawal and that I was ready to open myself up to the world of dating. So I phoned my sponsor and I told her about, you know, this encounter that I'd had with this person. And my sponsor's amazing. She is very consultative and really open-minded and she puts the ball in my court a lot. And she said to me, what do you feel about this? How does it make you feel? Do you feel that you're ready? And I said, yes, I think that I do. 
And, you know, her response was also, you know, if at any point you feel like you need to pull back, you can, you know, in this program, we have choices. The desperation and the obsession has left me. So I, with the help of my sponsor, my higher power and my fellows in recovery can make clear decisions on a good day. <laughs> so I, Funny enough, I didn't end up meeting this guy for coffee, but I decided to put myself out there and to start using dating apps. Um, so I consulted with my sponsor and we decided to put together a dating plan. Um, we used, I'm not sure if it is the official SLAA dating plan, but it seems to be across the board the standard plan that most people use. And the questions were really informative and it asked me a lot about my patterns around my previous relationships, you know, what I had done, what harm I had caused, um, you know, the types of people that I would go for. And my types had always been abusive, violent, people that I could control, um, you know, people who I could manipulate um, and, and generally people that I could, you know, wrap around my finger and do whatever I wanted with. Um, and being able to see those patterns was extremely healing um, and empowering as well. Um, and then, of course, the questions followed about, you know, how are you going to set out your dates? You know, what are you going to do? How are you going to communicate with this person? And I put down, you know, sort of stock standard things, um, you know, like no kissing until the third date, I think I said, no sex until three months. Um, uh, how long will it take you for you to know when you um, when you aren't really feeling this person if you're really interested in them you know and I think I said about three dates and also I promised myself that I would go on at least three dates um, with a person before pulling away so I went onto the dating apps I'm not going to name them but I went on to two and you know I for the first time I was presenting myself on an online platform authentically and honestly, you know, using my real age, using my real name, putting up pictures that actually looked like myself, you know, doing all of these things that was, that was so uncharacteristic of me. Um, and it was so liberating to do that, you know, and knowing that I had the support of like a million people behind me in this fantastic program with thousands of people who have gone through the same thing, you know, it was, it was so exciting. And then the app started and it was very overwhelming. I got like a million, you know, like hundreds of matches and, and weirdly enough, my, my social anorexia started to come up, you know, having to reply to text messages was super anxiety provoking. Like sometimes I felt like I just wanted to throw my phone against the wall. Um, but I persevered and I went out. I think I went out in a total of, I went out on dates with four different men. Um, so my first date with a guy was quite nice. We went to an art gallery, could have sort of stock standard date. Um, the second date, you know, similar experience, you know, people also going for people that I generally wouldn't have thought myself interested in, but there was just some kind of attraction, you know, and, and what's quite surprising about this program is how, when we actually put our recovery, when I put my recovery in action, how different, you know, my expectations are of myself. You know, I found, I found myself being attracted to people that I would never in a million years have even spoken to. Um, and, and so I put myself out there and I met a couple of guys and also chatting to guys and realizing that we weren't a match was very difficult for me. And my sponsor really had to give me a lot of support here because it would have been so easy for me to ghost and to go, okay, I, I, I don't want to talk to you anymore. I'm just going to block you. But I had to honestly say to them, thank you so much for your time. It's been great getting to know you, but I just don't think we're a match and I wish you everything of the best going forward. And I did that with everybody that I stopped, that I, that I was speaking to. Um, most of the dates didn't work out. Um, there was something that, you know, just didn't fit for me or, or they'd be a bit disrespectful or our lifestyles didn't really match. And then I decided to stop the dating apps. And I think in March this year, I was invited to a friend, um, a friend in recovery in, in the fellowships, housewarming, it was a, a Muslim um, prayer ceremony. And on my way out, I noticed this, this guy. Um, and I said to a friend, oh, he's really good looking. He's very cute. And he said to me, oh yeah, he is very sweet. I don't know why I didn't introduce you. And he lived in my area. 
and he's uber cancelled on him. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll give you a lift. And I gave him a lift and we really hit it off. And I asked a fellow in recovery to give my number to him and we got in contact with each other. And yeah, we've been dating now for five months. And what was quite surprising to me was after all of this effort that I'd put in trying to meet somebody online, my higher power had it in for me that I would meet somebody organically, which is a unicorn in this day and age, especially for somebody my age. You know, I don't know any gay people that meet people, you know, face to face, especially during a pandemic. So I decided to implement my, my uh, dating plan in this relationship. And I was very boundaried at first. I was very boundaried. Luckily, when I'd given him a lift, I had talked about my recovery. So he knew about my drug and alcohol addiction from the get go. Um, so we went on our first date. He was really lovely, really supportive, um, really open-minded. And I found myself being really drawn to him. He's also somebody that I typically would never have been attracted to. He's a total hippie, flower child, you know, into all of these esoteric kind of things. And I'm, I'm very, I'm a bit of a rational person and I find that stuff to be a bit woo woo. But he, he challenged me in a very new and different way and in a way that was really exciting. But at first, I, you know, it was, it was relatively easy because there was a distance. And um, I remember one, I think on our third date, um, my, my sober dating plan said that I'm not supposed to go into anybody's home for the first six dates, but he invited me up uh, for ice cream. So I went up to his house, I went up inside and, you know, we'd been eating ice cream and we kissed, which was also not on my dating plan. So I deviated from my dating plan. And then he said to me, oh, well, what do you want to do now? I knew exactly what he meant. But instead of me going along with, you know, having sex with him, my initial response was, it's getting really late and I have to go home. And I got home and I called my sponsor. <laughs> I was in a complete state. Believe that I had said no. I couldn't believe it. It was so overwhelming. I think I actually burst into tears, really, because. I couldn't believe that I had said no to this thing that had held me captive for so many years. I mean, I'd been abstinent for, for 19 months, I think, by that point. Um, and our relationship progressed. And, and the more time I spend with him, the more in love I become with him, which is also so counterintuitive for me. Disney, romance movies, novels all tell you that as time goes on, you sort of get used to somebody. But for me, I feel very sort of teenage girl syndrome, you know, really, really in love with this guy. In terms of our sex life, I decided to wait and I was very clear that I wanted to wait. And also um, I am HIV positive, which is, you know, bad decisions, consequences of my, my addiction. And having to tell him this was probably one of the most difficult things I've had to do in my recovery. It was really scary. It took me many weeks to get the, gut, the guts to do it, but I knew that I couldn't be in a relationship with somebody from a place of dishonesty. I knew that I couldn't. Um, so I sent him a text and I told him, and he was really, really supportive. And he has shown me that, you know, despite everything that I have done in my addiction, despite being somebody who I thought was not deserving of love, who would never find love, you know, this was fundamentally what I believed about myself, that those, those things were completely untrue. You know, I mean, sure, this relationship has brought up a lot of character defects you know i i feel what i'm what i'm dealing with at the moment is is feelings of you know oh i'm i'm not good enough you know he he's so giving and so um so kind and so good and i go i don't deserve this i can't accept these gifts you know i don't want this um but what i'm doing with that is i'm i'm being honest and i tell him how i feel and I say that I don't, I'm feeling insecure and I'm feeling unworthy. And, and I have to say this to you because I know that if I don't, I will get stuck in resentment and bitterness and anger and it will come out sideways. 
and what's been my saving grace in this program and in this relationship and in this experience of sober dating is my higher power, my friends in recovery and my sponsor. You know, the getting current is indispensable because no matter how far we have evolved in sobriety, we are never beyond the reach of temptation, song, siren song. So getting current and staying connected and doing the right things, doing the things I'm supposed to do, the simple program, which the more I work at, the less I understand how it works. But, you know, the, doing these simple things every day helps me to stay grounded and makes me more passionate for this program that has given me a life beyond my wildest dreams. And I say to my partner, you are everything that I've worked for. You know, I have worked so hard for this relationship and I'm so grateful that today I can participate in my own life. I can approach life from a place of honesty, integrity and authenticity. And I live a life free of the behaviors that held me bound and captive, behaviors that would have killed me. And today, I couldn't be more grateful. You know, I, I really couldn't be more grateful. So I'm really, I'm thankful for the opportunity to be here this evening to share my experience with you all. Um, so you mentioned your simple process each day. So what is your simple um, uh, daily, the simple things that you do each day? That's a really good question. Um, so, you know, I do, I, I do pray every day, a very simple prayer, you know, in another fellowship, the literature says that the nature of our beliefs will determine the nature of our prayers and meditations. And for me, I'm not a very religious person. I, I wouldn't even consider myself to be a very spiritual person outside of recovery. But rec my program asks me to pray. And so I use the prayers that are available to me, the serenity prayer, um, the uh, the third step prayer, the fourth step prayer, the ninth step prayer, and I ask, I pray these prayers, and for me that really grounds me, and also I try to connect with a member in SLAA every single day, or friends in recovery. Um, so those are the things that I do while trying to live life on life's terms, um, but generally if something comes up for me, if an anxiety comes up for me around my relationship, I reach out, and I have lots of people in my corner that are available for me all the time, and, and that's really, for me, what works. You know, what works is the connection, the connection to higher power and the connection to fellows in recovery. Thank you. Second question. How did you arrive at your decision to wait three months before sex? Um, so I, um, my sponsor and I had decided to, my sponsor and I decided to put kind of standard, um, standard, I wouldn't call them bottom lines, but standard boundaries around, um, around sex on my SLAA dating plan. But also, as I said earlier on, my sponsor is super consultative and she says that everything is open to interpretation in this program and that everything is um, subject to experience really. You know, how do I feel? Is sex going to bring up unmanageability? Is it going to bring up chaos for me? And to be honest, I think I actually waited a little bit more than three months before I had sex with um, my current partner. And I only did it once I knew and felt that I was ready to do it. And, and that, that gut feeling for me is experienced in a, in a sense of, in sort of the sense of serenity and calm. You know, I feel this calm. I don't feel those you know, the flutterings and, and anxiety and fear, you know, I mean, there were fears around having sex, you know, fears around, am I going to be able to enjoy this, you know, like, am I going to be able to do, be present, am I going to be able to enjoy sex sober, am I going to be able to experience intimacy, you know, like, in my, in my history of sex and love addiction, I had done everything that the human mind can possibly conceive of, you know, sexually, but I had never had a real intimate relationship sexually with another person, ever, ever, ever. That's one thing that I'd never done. And the idea of doing that terrified me. You know, I was so terrified because I didn't know how to not put on a performance or how to, um, you know, not to, I mean, 
I was a sex worker. So for me, sex was always this transactional thing. It was about me getting what I want and you getting what you want, if even that really, you know, it was always about me and needing to be expose myself to another person to be vulnerable, you know, to have somebody see me warts and all um, was a scary, a scary thing. But once I got to know him and once I trusted him, that's when I knew that I was ready. And once I, I trusted myself, you know, once I trusted myself and I had that feeling of serenity and desire. Um, so, you know, it wasn't necessarily a hard and fast rule the three month rule, it wasn't, it wasn't a hard and fast rule, but it just happened to work out like that. So, <laughs> so I hope that answers your question. Um, you mentioned wanting to throw the phone across the room rather than continuing to engage with potential dating partners. How did you move beyond that anorexia, that hmm. intimacy avoidance? Hmm. So I knew that what I was giving myself, I mean, I constantly had to bring myself back to the idea that what I'm doing, why I'm putting myself out there, isn't to find a boyfriend, isn't to, you know, open myself up to sex again. It's actually just to socialize, to make friends and to get to know people. Like that was fundamentally what I was doing. Um, and also to realize that I am giving myself a gift you know, what I'm doing is a gift to myself while also acknowledging my capacity, you know? So I acknowledged my capacity and I knew that perhaps I don't have the capacity to chat to somebody constantly, you know, every time they message me, I reply immediately. No, sometimes I would wait a day. Sometimes I would wait two days. And for me, that was okay. You know, I had to practice gentleness and compassion with myself all the time, you know, acknowledging that what I was doing is completely new and emotionally exhausting. You know, putting yourself out there is emotionally exhausting, but understanding for me that this, this process, this journey that I'm taking is a gift and it's something that is positive and beautiful. And I think acknowledging that for me really changed the narrative and helped me to move through that space of fear, you know, with the gentleness and with the compassion and with the understanding for myself. Thank you. You mentioned that the step process had given you this great insight into your personal characteristics. I don't like to call them defects of character, but your characteristics that were no longer helpful, such as that you were controlling and manipulative and, you know, very, very um, healthy and predictable consequences of, of coming from a dysfunctional family of origin, as many of us addicts have. How are you going when conflict arises in the relationship? H have you tackled conflict? And how do you become a healthy person in a relationship? Sorry, it's such a huge question. <laughs> It's a really big question. Yeah. So, I mean, what is amazing and probably a little bit frightening is that my partner and I have not had a fight yet. We've had a disagree. We've had disagreements, um, you know, about vaccinations and politics and you know those sorts of things. And I won't lie, I. There was a, a period a couple of weeks ago where I was really like connecting with my sponsor because a lot of character defects were coming out. Resentment, anger, I was nitpicking and like wanting to get upset about every single thing that he did, you know. Um, and, but the truth is like thinking about the person that I was and the type, the way that I used to handle conflict, you know, I would throw my toys out of the cot, I would smash things, I would fall on the ground and cry hysterically, I would try to self-harm, you know, I would, I would lash out, I would be violent, you know, I would tell people the most awful things about them, you know, and, and completely turn the tables on them. To be honest, this new spiritual person that I am, I could not imagine doing that. I couldn't imagine it, like it is so far removed from the person that I am today, you know, it would actually feel like acting out, you know, being passive aggressive, not communicating my emotions, um, you know, being angry without explaining, all of those things for me feel quite foreign, you know, like it would be 
emotionally acting out for me. And I, I don't feel, I mean, I'm yet to be tested in this. You know, we, I only know once I'm in the situation, but the way that I've dealt with our conflict, which we've had, um, you know, is I've really, I've, I've reached out to my sponsor and then I really tried to put myself in his shoes and to understand where he is coming from and to listen, you know, like to listen without wanting to respond because, you know, I know a lot about a lot of things and, <laughs> and I tend to want to be better or be smarter or um, be superior um, to other, you know, to the people around me because I, you know, because in the past I had very low self-esteem and in a relationship, my blueprint is still that, you know, I've never been in a healthy relationship with somebody before. I don't know how to be in a healthy relationship with somebody. I've never, ever done it before. And my only, my only experience of relationships in the past, you know, and the people that I've looked to, to see what a relationship is, were extremely dysfunctional. But I'm employing all of the, um, all of the, all of the 12 spiritual principles, or at least trying to employ the 12 spiritual principles in my relationship, particularly around conflict. So my partner told me this, story that really irritated me about how he was he was actually crying about like a donkey or something like that and for me I was just like this is I can't actually take this you know <laughs> this is too much for me <laughs> but instead of communicating how I felt I kept it in and I just ignored him but then I realized that that what I was doing was wrong you know I actually I actually dealt with that on my own and I I, I had that kind of moment of objectivity where I said to myself this is wrong and I spoke to him and I said, this is what I'm feeling. I'm feeling a little bit irritated by this whole thing, but I'm feeling irritated because I don't understand. And I, I constantly reinforced the idea in my relationship that yes, we are two different people and we have two different ways of seeing the world, but just because I don't understand your way of seeing the world doesn't mean that I don't accept it. And I have to constantly work on accepting him for everything that he is because that is what being in love with somebody means to me I have to accept them as they are and that is a process and it's something that I do every day and it's kind of like a step three you know surrendering accepting handing over and that for me is a constant practice and it's something that I'm doing all the time now you mentioned that you're in several programs and and quite a few of us have cross addicted or we have multiple challenges to sobriety, um, substance abuse and, and relationship difficulties. How long have you been in 12 step versus how long have you been in SLAA? And so, how did you make the decision to go to SLAA? So I, um, I've been, I've had experience with 12 step fellowships. I mean, my first, my first uh, 12 step meeting was when I was 15. So 13 years ago. Um, and I've sort of been to multiple treatment centers and, um, you know, I've, I've been to meetings and that kind of thing, but it really only stuck for me just over two years ago. Um, and I knew what SLAA was because I'd been to SLAA meetings before. And even in my, addic in my, in my active addiction, I knew that sex and love was my primary addiction. I just thought that I was born to be a sex and love addict. like I'm not worth anything else that's all I can do you know let me just be the best sex and love addict that I can possibly be <laughs> so when I came into recovery this time around um I came into SLAA pretty much immediately yeah like immediately I came into SLAA my clean time in another 12-step fellowship is only about six months six months different yeah um but you know, this is, the, for me, this is the program that saved my life because ultimately my substance addiction, my eating disorder, all of these things were a symptom of my sex and love addiction. You know, I, I use drugs because it allowed me to have sex with more people for longer without thinking about it, you know, and um, I could numb myself and, and not really have to look at what I was actually doing. Um, and they were so intrinsically linked you know, I, I couldn't, um, I couldn't like extrapolate them. Um, they were just so fundamentally the same thing. But I, in this, what I find with the SLAA program is that it's, 
this is just my experience of it or the way that I've worked it with my sponsees and my sponsor, is that it's really inclusive of all areas of addiction. You know, we look at everything in this program. It's very trauma oriented, oriented, you know? Um, and, and really that's, you know, other 12 experiences of 12 steps that I've had is very much, you're an addict, you have a disease, you, you know, you, you need to focus on this obsession, you need to stop using immediately. But with SLAA, it's a lot more complex than that. And, and I've gone a lot deeper than I ever expected to go. Um, so for me, this is the program that saved my life, you know, through without a shadow of a doubt. Thank you. Now, another question about your life. How are you keeping the balance between living your own life, working your recovery, and not getting lost in the relationship? That is a great question. Um, so I'm very boundaried around my time. Um, and I've made it very clear that in this, I've made it very clear with my partner that I want us to live our lives, you know, and not getting meshed in each other's spaces and in each other's lives and, you know, for the relationship to be too much about me or too much about him. Um, so, I mean, we don't see each other every single day. We talk every day. Um, but, you know, for me, a relationship now needs to be like a Venn diagram, you know? I am me, he is him, and we come together to share our experiences. Um, and also being aware that without my program, I wouldn't be able to do any of this. I wouldn't be able to have any of this. Um, so I have to stay focused on what matters, um, on what's the most important. Recovery comes first before anything else for me. Um, it, is the, it is the key that has unlocked the door to potential in my life. You know, for the first time I have potential in my life. I have, I'm moving towards something, not hurtling towards death. And, you know, it it is it is tough, but also I have I really have a a strong awareness. Um, I have a strong awareness around how I am being in my relationship at any given moment. You know, I, I try to keep objectivity. I try to keep awareness, and if I feel myself getting drawn in, I I pull myself back. You know, I'm very I, I've become quite good at like self regulating and and like self. Um, managing myself, you know, in recovery, um, which is a real gift, you know, it's a, it's a real gift to be able to do that. You know, like I, I will be in a situation, I'll immediately sort of almost perceptively be able to deal with things as they come up. Um, but, but yeah, I think that, I think it is a bit of an ebb and flow, but I mean, for the most part, I've managed to retain my own personality and my own identity and also remembering where disappearing into another person has taken me, you know, remembering where another be, being sucked into another person has taken me. I try to kill myself, you know, because this person was taking themselves away from me. He said, I can't be with you anymore. And what would I be without him? Nothing. I would be, I was nothing. I, I couldn't survive without him. And the, the idea of going back to that, I call it a healthy fear, you know, um, it, it, it sort of keeps me in that space of like, you need to be constantly vigilant and, and aware, but also not vigilant, not vigilant from like a kind of, oh my gosh, you have to keep your eyes open all the time, you have to be so careful, but like wearing it like a loose garment, you know, wearing that vigilance and that awareness with a loose garment and not being so over involved in my own behavior and taking my own inventory like every five seconds, but taking stock regularly, you know, of where I am and what I'm doing. Quick follow up question. How many meetings are you doing a week? And when did you broach the subject with him, if you did at all, that mm. you're in SLAA? So I do two meetings a week um, at the moment. I um, I mean, that's kind of what I what I need at the moment. I should probably do more, but I'm also studying full time. I work full time. I'm in a relationship. I have two sponsees. So I do have quite a busy life, <laughs> you know. Um, 
So I do have quite a busy life, but I do a lot of service. You know, I'm I'm on in each meeting that I do, I, I have service, which keeps me um, which keeps me accountable. And in terms of telling my partner that I'm in SLA, a, I haven't really told him necessarily, but he has met people in this fellowship. He's met people in in recovery. Like I think. I, our fourth date, he went to my sponsee's birthday party and there were like 25 people there, you know, from SLAA. And I'm sure he heard the term thrown around and, you know, he's heard me on the phone talking about sex and love addiction. And he knows a lot about my history. Like he knows about the unmanageability around sex and that kind of thing. But I haven't outright said I am a member of Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous. Uh, but I showed him the flyer for the sober dating event and it says SLAA on it. So, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Next question is from someone who says, I feel fearful of all relationships. And I wonder if you could speak to how you conquer fear when it shows up mm. here in recovery. So fundamentally what it comes down to is the AA big book says that we have never seen a person relapse when they thoroughly work the AA program and I know that if I am doing the next right thing if I'm working my program to the best of my ability on a daily basis there is no chance in hell that I'm going to slip or relapse it's impossible I've never read a book more smug than the AA big book in my life this will work it is going to work this is what's worked it will work for you it's worked for us you know, like that book is almost a hundred years old, <laughs> you know, and it's worked for millions of people. So for me, fear is just such an unreasonable, not unreasonable, that's a very harsh word, not the right word, but fear is, it doesn't have any place in my recovery. I, fear comes up for me, but I say to my high power, take this fear away from me. I know that I'm living in your will for me. I'm living your will for me right now. I'm appreciative of all the gifts that I have in my program, you know, and, and I, I don't have to live in fear because I'm doing the best that I can every day, which is all anybody could ever ask, you know, and be, being the best that I can be doesn't mean like I am excelling at everything and I'm amazing and I have no character defects, you know, no, it doesn't mean that at all. It just means that I'm, I'm doing what I can on that day to the best of my abilities, whether doing the best that I can on that day is working for five minutes and watching The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills for the rest of the day, that's okay, you know, <laughs> that is okay. It's just about doing the best that I can. And, and, and I promise you like the 12 promises and the 12 signs of recovery, they come true. They come true sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly they say, but they, they come true. You know, they have manifested in my life in every way, you know, and it's really a wonderful way for me to measure, um, to measure the, um, how well I'm doing in my program, you know. The, the issue of disclosure was a huge thing for me. It was a huge thing. And I just, I, I didn't know what to do around this. And I ended up posting um, a little thing in one of the outreach WhatsApp groups and I spoke to, somebody in the UK that I'd never met before, never spoken to her before in my life. And she said, you know, your life is your life. You know, you choose to share what you want to share when you want to share it. You know, you are not beholden to anybody. On my bottom, one of my bottom lines is um, inappropriate conversations and oversharing because I would overshare to get a reaction out of people to see if they were going to leave me, you know, to try and shock them, you know, all of these like unhealthy things. And it was so empowering for somebody to give me permission and just say, in your own good time or not at all, you know, I am who I am now. And that's what matters. My past no longer defines me. It doesn't define me anymore. I'm not that person. I never will be, but I'm grateful for that person helping me to get where I am today. Um, so I just wanted to add that. I'm going to ask a... Um... I edit the video later, don't worry. So I take myself chatting out of it. But I'll preface this question with, in my part of the world at least, we find a lot of people come into SLAA in a lot of pain in relationship breakdown. They come mm. from other 12-step fellowships because it's quite hard to even hear about SLAA. But, mm. you know, so the ordinary 
person wouldn't even know about it, but if you're in, you know, AA or NA or one of the others, you might be lucky. And that's what happened to me. I'm 18 mm. years sober in another fellowship. You might be lucky enough to have someone say, I'll go along to SLAA. But what we find is that when people reach the state you're at, where they're stable and in a relationship, they leave mm. the fellowship. Mm. What's your thinking around, do you see SLAA having a role in your life going forward now that you've won what many would say is the prize? I mean, this fellowship, I will be a part of this fellowship for the rest of my life. For the rest of my life and I am profoundly grateful for that because this program has given me the tools that I need to have reached this place you know and I'm not going to call it a goal it's just where I'm at it's my higher powers goal for me my higher power wants me to have a healthy relationship with somebody but if I deviate from my program and if I if I leave all of the stuff behind history shows that I will fuck it up, excuse my language, but I will fuck it up. I will ruin everything because I do not know how to do these things on my own. You know, if I didn't have these steps, if I didn't have these meetings, if I didn't have my sponsor, if I, you know, if I didn't, you know, pray to my higher power, I am doomed to fail. And that goes for everybody in this meeting. If you do not, if you do not work your program, then, you know, things are bound to fall apart you know that's just the way that unfortunately we have the disease of addiction and you know the disease of addiction never goes away but it can be arrested with a simple program and I have to hold on to that simple program with everything that I have you know because without it I cannot survive you know and it's simple as that you know it's this program or it's death for me it's a life or death thing it's this program or death and I don't want to die <laughs> I don't want to die. I want to live a life happy, joyous, and free. You know, I want to have healthy relationships. I want to have fun. I want to pursue interests and activities that I enjoy for myself. I want to be with friends and family and body and mind. You know, I want all of these things. And I can only get these, these things through the working of this program. There is no other way that I can get those things. And it's, it's for me, it's really just a simple, <laughs> it's like a simple thing. Like, I need this program. And I will always need it, you know? And if I start to feel that I don't need it, then I start to worry. And then I get connected with my sponsor and I go, something is happening, I'm feeling disconnected. And my sponsor will probably be like, you need to do step work. <laughs> She's laughing. <laughs>